start recording. Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game live on stream. Uh, we are doing some animation coding, uh, basically showing how to do some, some handmade animation code. Uh, and it's really good, you know, um, learning to do handmade animation code is, is really a pretty good idea uh, to do before you ever implement a general animation system. Like, loading and playing back animations is a fine thing to do, and you typically want to do it if you're on a team that's got a bunch of artists who have tools they can use to make animations. You obviously want that. Uh, but it's always a good idea to first cut your teeth on some hand-coded animation, and the reason for that is because it will get you familiar with the concepts and how to do sort of the sets of things you might want to do in animation code, and it, it allows you to make much more dynamic stuff. And so then in the future, when you do use an animation system or however you're doing it where there's, they're externally authored, you can still jump in and times when it's, it's the right thing to do to have something procedural kick in, you're not like, I don't know what to do, right? Um, so it's kind of nice. It's a good thing, I think, that most programmers should know how to do. Now, uh, like I said, we're kind of right in the middle of it. Today's day 275, so if you want to follow along, uh, day 274 source code is the one that you want uh, to work with. I'm going to load up for a coder here. And handmade proj. Let's go get this going on and run it. All right. Uh, so essentially what I was working on was I was making this sort of code here where uh, I could I could make the dude hop along and we're sort of getting to a nice place on it but we have a big to-do left which as you can obviously see at the moment um, the the uh, head we just worked on the body animation and we let the head go wherever it wants now that would be fine if this was some kind of ghost child and you know the head of the child is supposed to uh, be able to float around as like a separate thing, but that is not at all what the game is. The game is actually supposed to have uh, a, a actual child whose head is attached to his body. So we need to uh, figure out you know some way of of um, of starting to to make the body part stretch up towards the head so even when it's a bit far away it can sort of reach you know what I mean um, and so how exactly we're gonna do that uh, I'm not sure because obviously there's some considerations with how it's going to look uh, but we don't have a whole lot of options one of the things that you have to remember about games in general and it's kind of just unfortunate but it's the truth is that responsiveness is very important and so when you're coding the interface, you know, you're going to code, if you're a responsible game developer, you're going to code it so it feels good, right? Um, <clears throat> and you're not going to sacrifice that feel just so the animation looks better. Because that's just a bad idea. Now, if you want to know what that feels like, go back to the very original, say, Prince of Persia, or Karateka, for example. Uh, the original Jordan Mechner games there. Those were examples of games that decided to just let animation determine entirely what was going to happen and the controls feel absolutely 100% awful as a result. Uh, you basically like, you know, you hit jump and your guy like runs for a while and then jumps because that's what the animation did or whatever, right? And it just feels awful to play. Um, and so that's the kind of thing you want to steer clear of, in my opinion, uh, when you're programming the game. You want to do the opposite. You want to let uh, the design or the designer make whatever is supposed to feel good and then you do whatever you can to make the animations not look bad as a result but you don't ever go well this animation kind of looked bad because of this you know the player can turn too quickly so i'm gonna like force them to turn more slowly that's just rarely a good idea at least the games that feel sluggish and the controls don't feel responsive anymore uh, so you know if your designer tells you to do that that's one thing but as a programmer uh, it's your responsibility to not get in the way of the design like that. So figure out how to write your animation systems so that they respond to what the player must do, not so that they force the player to do things that they didn't want to do in the first place. I feel pretty strongly about that, and I think most players probably do too. Um, so that's what we're going to do here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and say, well, you know, if it looks kind of weird and stretchy, that's okay. We'll just say that's part of the style, uh, and we're not going to try and fix that. Uh, by forcing the head to not move too far or anything like that. All right. Um, so as this hops along, what I'm going to try to do first, well, there's a couple things I want to do first. I want to do a little bit of cleanup first, and maybe, I don't know if we'll get to the body stretching thing today. That's our next major to-do. But I've got some smaller to-dos um, <clears throat> that I need to work on as well. 
And one of the big to-dos that I need to work on is already the head doesn't, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it's not really big to-dos. One of the primary minor things is it feels a little bit, I don't like the feel right now. And the reason for that is that spring that we added on that brings you back to the body. Uh, that spring should not be springing uh, to where the body is. It should be springing, um, well, two things. First of all, it should be only springing if I'm not uh, using, if I'm not actively trying to move in a direction, obviously, uh, which I think is okay at the moment. Like I think that's, uh, we turned that off. But when I do let go, I don't want it to suck back towards the body. I want it to suck to wherever the body's gonna end up, right? So I essentially want the head to like to snap to a point, whatever the closest point is to the head, regardless of whether the body's gotten there yet, right? Um, so all I'm really gonna do there, and don't ask me why I close the program. I always close the program for no reason. That's just what I do, apparently. Let's launch that back up again. Um, all I'm gonna do here at first for that is I'm gonna go into world mode where we're doing that sort of closest point thing. Uh, and I'm gonna take the, let's see here, oops. I should be over here. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into this code for the hero head. Uh, and I'm gonna pull out the code that I was using for the hero body so that I can search for the closest point in both cases, right? Uh, and this is actually an important step for the code anyway, because uh, eventually we're gonna want, you know, we don't really wanna do all of these tests. We want a spatial query, you know, we've got a to-do right here for it. So it's true in general that I'm gonna wanna be able to issue some of these spatial queries and accelerate them. So I'd like to get in the habit of calling a function do that anyway, because that function uh, is gonna get a lot more complicated and I want lots of people to have access to however it's going to work. All right, so uh, I'm just gonna pull that out here into a little thing that, you know, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that goes through and does its thing. Uh, something probably like, uh, this sort of a thing because uh, I'm just computing well I guess I really only need the closest P part so I'm gonna take this out I'm gonna uh, drop this here uh, and I'm gonna say all right internal void uh, get closest traversable uh, and that's gonna go ahead and uh, that's gonna go ahead and say well uh, from whatever point I'm starting with uh, and uh, we'll just assume that, that that's gonna replace the entity point that we were using before. Um, well, I guess we should say really uh, from P and default P might be the better way to do it. Something like that probably. Although the other way I could do it is like this. Uh, maybe we we have a bool that says whether or not we found one and then we write the result if we did. Uh, so we'll basically say like found equals false. Uh, and in here we would say like found equals true because we got one. Uh, and then we'd write uh, closest P to result. Um, although really, I guess I can just sort of say, well, get rid of this and just say that this is result equals that. Like so. Uh, so what comes out of here, I don't know if I need a struct though, because I don't know whether I used closest distance. Uh, it looks like I didn't, but you know, we probably will need to augment this function as we go further, because people are probably gonna want more. When we do these facial queries, we're probably gonna have to uh, provide more information than what we're giving here. But you know, I, rather than be premature about it, I'll just let that happen when it happens. Obviously I need the sim region here because that's the thing that we're looping over. And that'll be the thing that eventually has the spatial query inside of it. Uh, we've got the from P, which is what we're actually testing. Uh, so in here, instead of head P, we're talking about from P. And uh, I think that's roughly everything there is to it. So I'm gonna then go ahead and change the hero head uh, code in here to use that. Well, I, I guess I should do the body one first, obviously. Uh, so I'm gonna say here that we've got that closest P and the closest P is gonna be like get closest traversable and it's gonna take the, the region and it's gonna be the closest thing to the head. Uh, and this is going to be, oh, I guess, um, we should do it like that. 
And so it's going to overwrite closest P if it finds anything. And I also get a bullet back that tells me if I did find it, but I don't actually need to know that in this particular piece of code uh, at the moment. Right? So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, there's a closest traversable uh, in here as well. right? So when I go to call, when I step into the hero head code, uh, I want to know that as well. And you can see in here that um, uh, when I go to do this simulation, currently what I'm doing is I'm looking for the body and I'm snapping to the body, but I don't actually need to do that right now uh, anymore. What I can do instead is say like, hey, let's take a look to see whether we got one of these traversables, like so. Uh, and assuming that I did, then instead of using the body, we'll just, we'll just use that. So I'm not going to use the body P anymore. I'm going to use the closest P. Um, and uh, the only thing I'm going to do, since I don't want to adjust the Z, is I'm going to say that let's, um, uh, let's not match. In fact, I guess I don't. Hmm. Nope, 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 nope. I'm going to do it. I'm just going to keep, I'm going to do the Z as well. Uh, so I'm just going to entirely replace the head P with the closest P, and that's it. Or sorry, the uh, body P with the closest P, uh, and that's everything. And uh, then I'm going to recompile. So uh, head is not relevant here. We're actually looking for the closest thing to us. Because we are the head. And so that's much nicer now. Yeah. So the other thing I want to do too is I don't really want, uh, the facing direction at the moment is based on the movement. And I don't like that at all. The facing direction should be based on the last direction I push. Because you can see what's happening here. If I overshoot and come back, the head, because it faces in the direction it goes, flips. But I don't want it to flip. I just want it to use whatever the last direction I pushed was. Uh, and so I'm going to take a look at where that face direction is set. I think it's set in move entity. And that's just stupid, and I don't want it. Uh, my head appears to be blocking this, but I'll just zoom down a little. So leave facing direction whatever it was, or face direction equals ATN2. So these are just not, I don't want this, right? I don't want this at all. Uh, so really, really, I'm just going to say this code gets nerfed out. Uh, and probably what I want to do is I want that to be based on uh, what direction you are pushing with the controller. And so since the DDP code here, uh, the con hero DDP is really the code that I'm looking for, uh, then setting the head at least, uh, I, I guess we can do this, right? We can say like, um, Let's take that DDP uh, and use that. So that's like what direction I was trying to accelerate in. Uh, and that's, that's almost surely going to be better. Yeah, because that's what I want. I just want it to kind of slide back. I don't want it to turn or anything like that. And the other thing I want is I probably want that to be pretty quick. So right now it's not particularly tight. Uh, the spring is like relatively weak. Uh, also, we don't need that code anymore. Uh, so I think I want this to be a little bit beefier. And so, uh, yeah, like, I guess the only thing that feels odd to me about it now, I mean, other than the fact that we need to fix up the fact that the head and the body are totally desegregated, the only thing that feels particularly weird about it now um, is that when I move, if I'm off center and I stop, it feels good. Like, that feels fine. Like. That actually feels totally fine. Um, you know what I actually want to do too. You know what I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about that in one second though. Let me let me let me do one more thing. I actually want to be able to hop, strafe hop, and so you know the sword stuff is 
not what I ever wanted, really. That was, we were just playing with that. That has nothing to do with the game design. We were just doing some stuff. Uh, so I'm going to get rid of that, and it's really the D sword stuff that's what would, I would want the, to determine the facing direction. It's the last direction I attacked in is actually what I would want. Uh, so really, it's like con hero uh, D sword, or yeah, D sword is actually what I want. And so I think putting that in just temporarily, even though we're not dealing with attacks or anything at the moment, I want to just see what that feels like because that's more that informs my decisions a lot better if I can actually see the hopping uh, using that methodology. And of course, I closed the program. Why did I close the program? I have no idea. Force of habit. So this is actually what it will look like. So I'll be like strafing around like this, and then maybe I will like start attacking something below me, and I'll go like this, right? And then I'll attack something here or here. And so this is actually what that would be like. Uh, so, okay, so stopping onto a square feels fine to me now because once I let go, I don't really care so much about what happens. It's like, it's like, it's like the, you know, on an analog stick, you know, I'm fine with it sucking back to the center, right? But what I don't like, what does not feel good to me is as I'm hopping along, if I'm right in a row, it feels fine. But if I'm below the row, the fact that it sucks me up like that feels weird. So like when I'm hopping this way and then I go up, that recentering doesn't feel great. And so I wonder if maybe I just shouldn't do that. Uh, maybe I should say that when we do the, the sort of spring back to the center, maybe I was premature and I said, we don't need that code, let's delete it. Maybe I really wanna make sure that all of the things are in fact uh, zero. Like I'm not, I only wanna spring back when I'm not pushing anywhere. So if I was to do that, I would just say like, what's the, uh, length of the DDP, uh, so let's do uh, should apply equals length DDP less than 0.1. So basically if I don't have any application, um, then I'll just do should apply here. And that definitely feels better, so even though it's kind of wonky and it means that you don't really go into the channel. Um, I guess what I could do is make the spring stiffness based on that. So what I could do potentially is say, well, okay, so I'll keep this code here, which is to say this is the code to tell me whether I want to apply anything at all. Uh, but this is the code which says what the factor is. So really this is an R32 that's like my, um, my coefficient for, on, on the position of the spring. And what I'll say is like, okay, if, if you're not pushing at all, then it's the super stiff spring. If you're not, if you're, um, uh, if you are pushing in some direction, but not in the direction of correction at this particular point, like for whatever axis we're talking about, then we will use a weak for us to gently guide you back, but in a way that's hopefully so subtle you won't know or, or won't uh, be bothered by it, right? So then it's kind of like, just feels a little bit more di like diagonal, you know what I mean? To kind of catch you back in there. And I don't know how I feel about that. Still doesn't feel great. I think the best feeling thing is just not to do it. I don't know. It might just be that it's only it only should happen when you when you land. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, B thirty two any push equals this. And I guess really it's just like, hey, yeah, that's not so much. We can always change it back, but it does kind of seem like, um, it does kind of seem like it wants to be free floating.
I'm going to leave it like that. It's obviously a decision that we can make later on when we play the game and see how it feels. Uh, because again, it's not going to make a huge difference in terms of any other sort of design thing, but it's just like, hey, uh, you know, you got to tune the game so that it feels good to you. I mean, you know, whoever the person who's responsible uh, for it has to tune it. And so I think in this case, uh, it just feels better when I don't do that. So I think that's what I'm going to stick with for now. Uh, and because that's starting to feel much better. Yeah, and so even though it'll kind of be like a little weird, I think that's just what we want to do. Because in general, like any game where you have a grid-based thing that people have to work with, there's a, a number of, you know, I mean, the best possible thing for clarity is always if the person's just directly on the grid. But the bottom line is it just doesn't feel good in a game to lock a person to a grid like that, usually. Um, especially not in an action game. And so you kind of have to be careful about what you do. And so I just want to make sure that we don't compromise the feel of moving the character for the grid. So the grid is supposed to be something uh, that sort of like happens. That's why there's the body and the head as separate pieces is because I want to make sure that that uh, works and that's something we can do. Uh, so that's starting to feel pretty good there. Um, so let's, I guess let's go ahead and start tackling that last part, which is just making the, the two things connect. Uh, and then once we've got that going, I think we're kind of at the point where I think we want to go revisit the renderer a little bit and tidy up all of our stuff so that everything's sorting properly, probably uh, fix the hero bitmaps a little bit, uh, and, and just do the assorted kind of um, assorted little to-dos that are stopping us from having a correct looking character, uh, like the fact that those are sorting in the opposite order and stuff like that. So we want to just fix all of those and make sure that those are correct. So uh, in this scenario, what I need to do is I need to start by uh, exposing m some of the capabilities of our renderer because one of the things our renderer can do is our renderer can scale things, our renderer can shear things, and our renderer can uh, rotate things. But since we have done literally no rendering of that nature, uh, we don't have any way to actually specify that as part of like when we specify a bitmap. So what I need to do is open up the code uh, in the renderer so that I can actually send it the ability that, you know, I can actually send it information about the fact that we need our uh, our body to, to scale or, you know, uh, stuff like that, right? I need I need to sort of have, have that work. So how am I gonna do that? Let's take a look. Uh, here we go to handmade render group. Uh, and you can see that in handmade render group, we've got like a render entry rectangle and that's got, you know, uh, the ability to scale, I guess, uh, but no rotation and no shearing. So there's no axis specified, there's just the dimension. And so what I would like to do is have some way of specifying uh, additional information and probably I want there to be, oh, whoops, and then probably this is for bitmaps. Uh, so I probably want another type of render entry that's like render entry um, like uh, flexible bitmap or something like that. Uh, and in addition to the color, uh, the P and the size, instead of specifying size as two, just two like sort of distances, uh, what I'll do instead is specify the X axis and the Y axis. And those will come out of the, the point P, right? Um, and so in order to do this, uh, I need to add the ability in the renderer to do a push bitmap call that actually has this information associated with it. Uh, now I could make it so that we always specify this, but I feel like it's probably a good idea to keep this in case we ever want to increase the rendering throughput of stuff that doesn't have to be uh, rotated. Um, we might want to do that. Now, obviously, uh, well, you know what? Honestly, that's probably not all that necessary because it's easy to test at the X and the Y axis. Yeah, it's easy to test the X and Y axis and jump. So I feel like probably actually what we can do is just change this. I feel like we can just go with a single one. Hey, hey how many times am I gonna do that? Hey. It's like a pair of zircon encrusted tweezers. Let's go ahead and... Uh, just do the corrections necessary to make this work. Not changing anything, just gonna render the exact same stuff, but I'm gonna now, instead of just encoding a size, I'm gonna encode that, that directionality as well. 
All right, so I'm gonna start with the OpenGL renderer because that happens to be what we're, we're using. And then we'll switch over to the software render and make sure that handles it too, um, because we might as well keep both working. It'll be pretty tr trivial to do so since our software rasterizer does already handle this case. So it's not like it's some, we gotta go write rendering code. It's just a, a case of setting it up properly. Um, so here's the way that we were rendering something, and you can see us calling OpenGL Rectangle, and that's not really going to cut it anymore because OpenGL Rectangle uh, is something that draws an, uh, re something rectilinear, right? And you can see that happening here. So what we need to do is we need to actually have uh, this, this little fellow here uh, do a more explicit thing where it's not going to be rectilinear like that. So I'll, I'll drop this in here uh, for starters, and then we're going to change how it works. Uh, so min UV, max UV, obviously, will just flow through properly. Uh, and then we've got the max P and the min P, and those are here, and those will flow through properly. So if I was to do nothing else, right, if I wasn't, to, if I was to do absolutely zero here, uh, then you know what I can also do here? I can just do this. Has, there's a, you can point to it. You can pass a pointer to a color and have it loaded, so. Um, so if I was to just do this, I could delete the OpenGL a rectangle call, I believe, and be fine. So I'm going to double check that that's true, uh, and then we'll go from there. Uh, let's see. Size is not a member of that's true. Um, you know what? I probably should do. I should probably do these changes one at a time. Render group dot h b2 size. All right. Uh, cannot convert one from from VR to console. Oh, sorry. Yes, you need to point it to the floats, don't you? Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and run, and I should see exactly the same thing on the screen as I did before, which is what I want. Uh, and then, and I do have to restart the app now because this is not in the reload section. This is in the rendering code. Uh, so now what I need to do is I need to make this code actually work with sort of a stretched version of the bitmap. And what that means is that instead of being able to use uh, the, the concept of a min and a max p, I actually need four separate points, right? I need each corner because they can be sheared and rotate. There's, there's no, there's, it's not like two boundaries anymore. I need to know uh, the different points. So just to be explicit about this, right? Uh, if I'm just drawing something that's that's rectangular and aligned with the screen, uh, then it's pretty easy. Well, I guess I'll do it this way. Uh, it's pretty easy to send down a minimum x y uh, and a maximum x y, and that specifies obviously the entire rectangle because it's just like it's like bounding this by a set of four planes, right? The min and the max in each axis. But as soon as I move over to something that could be rotated, scaled, and sheared, um, let me see if I can draw something kind of crazy that illustrates that. Uh, so, right? This is now a totally legal shape for our renderer to output, and the, the bitmap will just get kind of squashed around in there. And so if that's what we're going to do, uh, then you can kind of see that, like, hey, we can't really specify it to the renderer anymore as... Um, as a min and a max. Instead, we're going to need something else. And so what I was saying is, well, let's just pass in, you know, uh, here and here. Okay. And then I know we can produce these other four points because like we just take the center point that we have and we do, we subtract this and this to get this guy. We add this and subtract this to get this guy. We add both of them to get this guy. And we add this one and subtract this one to get this guy. Right. So we can produce all four points. And so then what this becomes is this becomes us, um, uh, sort of having to generate those four points from what we're given. And uh, to generate those points, uh, you know what we could also do here because both uh, render paths are probably, well, no, I guess they don't really need it. Um, so what we're gonna do here is just say, okay, assuming that we've got the other information in there, let's, let's jump over to rendergroup.h, assuming that we've got these in there, uh, x-axis and y-axis, uh, and these are scaled, in fact, I'll note that, Uh, so if we want to go through and do this code, <clears throat> what we need to do is produce like the min point. So this is min min. This is essentially min min p. It's min x min y, right? In fact, we could do it this way. Uh, well, I'll just do min min. Ah, min x min y. So that's min x min y. This is max x min y. And again, I can also do this with the uh, with the floating point passing. I want to. 
this one is max x, and I'm just, like I said, I'm just reading these off here, max y, <clears throat> uh, min x, min y, uh, max x, max y, and min x, max y. Okay. Uh, so if we take a look at what happens here, all of our UV coordinates are going to be exactly the same, and now we're just computing these points a little bit differently. Uh, so what we can do now is say, well, we have our min x min y point, our min x uh, max y point, our max x min y point, uh, and our max x max y point. Those are our points. We know that these are all going to start uh, at p, you know, at our, at our main point, and then we're going to need, you can see here, we've got this uh, x-axis, y-axis thing. This is literally the equation, and in fact, I guess we can just, um, I'm interested to know, oh, so our entry P, oh, so our entry P is already based in the lower left corner. So these can just be scaled by the actual dimension, are already scaled by the dimension, apparently. I don't know if I like that, but we can always change it, so no big deal. Anyway, uh, so if I want to move on from here, I can simply say, all right, we've got the P, which is that, that entry P, and I guess we could still call it min P because that makes sense. And then this is really the code. This is the entirety of the code we need is this exact code. It's now what we're doing is saying, hey, we don't need to multiply by the size anymore because these are multiplied by the size already. We don't need to construct them in place because they actually exist in the entity itself. Uh, and then all we have to do is construct uh, each of the points by doing exactly what we just said. So min x means subtract the x, max x means add the x, min y means subtract the y, uh, max x means add the y. And so there's our four points on the corners of our parallelogram, which could be rotated, you know, it's a rotated and sheared uh, square, right? So it becomes a parallelogram of arbitrary dimension. Uh, arbitrary size. Dimension, I guess, could mean something else in this context, so we won't use that. Uh, and so then we should be basically all set. Uh, now all we have to do is actually record this information uh, in the actual renderer, and we should be good to go. Now if I switch back to the uh, renderer, the regular software renderer, uh, which is somewhere, where is that? Here it is. In the regular software renderer, when we're rendering a bitmap, you can see us calling draw rectangle quickly. Now the same stuff applies here, right? You can see that we've basically already set ourselves up for success. Really all we have to do is, is pass these along, and I think that's it. Like that's all we need to do to support what we were trying for. Uh, so I think that's the entirety of the modifications. So really most of the work we're gonna have to do now is going to be about actually passing this data down uh, to the renderer. It's not about the renderer code handling it, uh, because it will just handle it. So, okay, we can start by supporting the existing push bitmap call. This is not going to be particularly difficult because we know what the size is. So if we instead just keep the size as a V2 real quick, real quick like, uh, then we know what the x-axis is um, and we know what the y-axis is, right? Uh, because all they're going to be is just whatever that size x was, um, that's, that goes into the x component. Um, and whatever the size y was, that's what goes into the y component. So that'll do our, that's all we were doing before. Uh, so we can just do it now. Uh, so then if we come in here and, uh, wait, what am, what's the problem? Uh, oh, entity, I spelled it wrong. Uh, so now if we come in here, we just have to clean up these calls where I forgot the v. And I think we should be good to go. When I run this code, hopefully if I didn't mess anything up, and I obviously did, that's kind of spectacular. You have to admit that's awesome. Um, we should get it basically the exact same thing on the screen. So it definitely messed something up there, and that's not a good thing. Oh, uh, you know what I just realized? Where is render group? There we go. Um, mm -hmm. Minus x axis, plus x, ah. Uh, so, min min, we don't subtract anymore. So we just have, I don't know why I deleted all that. 
So we we don't subtract because that was I did that as if we were doing half dimensions, but that's not what we're doing. We're doing whole dimensions. So I doubled the scale of everything, right? Um, I was still thinking this in my head, but really what we have is this. Right? So all we do is start at P, we add the x-axis, we add the, I'm sorry, we add the x-axis, we add the y-axis, you know, so that's it. We don't have to do the subtraction. So since I was doing it, I was essentially doubling the size because these were the whole size of, the, of a side, and I was doing that, which was just dumb. Um, again, had the wrong mental model stuck in my brain for some reason. Uh, so now I think we're good, and uh, that allows us now to render anything that's like uh, scaled and sheared and rotated, um, which is what we need. So now we just need a code, like I said, most of the work is getting it down there. Now we just need some code that can actually specify some useful things here uh, when we call push bitmap. Uh, so you can see that we've got a couple different ways of calling it here. Um, and uh, I think what we want to do is we probably want, uh, again, this to sort of get uh, one more step removed so that these are, you know, kind of, again, inlineable, we hope. Uh, and what I can do here is say, well, okay, so uh, the sizes that come down on these, uh, we can just multiply those by maybe two vectors that we end up getting um, that we pass in, right? So maybe I can just say like, okay, uh, well, let me think about this. So C align, we just have a ton, we just have so many things that we pass to push bitmap, it's kind of annoying. Um, but, you know, like if we wanted to, right, we could even stick these on the end here, right? These, this could just be um, x-axis, y-axis, uh, if we want to. Uh, and again, not, it's not great, uh, but we totally could do that. Because then what we would do is just say, well, whatever the size x is times the x-axis, uh, and whatever the y, the size y is times the y axis. Now, the only thing that I'm not sure is if that we have would have any problem with that as far as the scale, the nonlinear scale is concerned. Um, and I have to think about that because if you think about what happens here, right? When we go through and say get bitmap dimensions, we get back some scale values that are based on projecting those sizes. And so that projection is nonlinear, uh, which means we can't just multiply it on the outside. So I feel like uh, we kind of need that to be more respected. Now, if you always pass in non-scaled axes, That would be fine. But at some point, I think that's just not what you want, if that makes sense. So I'm going to take this back a bit. And think about this. So inside get bitmap dim, uh, well, I guess it's, it's actually get render uh, NV basis P, I suppose. Um, because we get the basis scale. Oh, well, I guess it's okay because we have it as a separate scale. And so I guess we baked the nonlinearity into that. Is that correct though? Does that actually work? How does our, um, how does our get render empty basis code work? Let's take a look. So where I produce the scale it's the meters to pixels, the projected x, y, dot z. So the projected x, y, dot z, uh, which is the one over the focal length times raw x, y. So it's definitely dividing that value by, it's multiple, well, so yeah, that's, that actually is gonna be totally fine. All right, I take it back. I guess that would just work. I think that just works. Conveniently for us. 
uh, we can just do that. So the way this is working in here is we pass in a height value, right? And the height value, it does some like uh, monkeying around to sort of get that to, uh, to, to be scaled properly. And so what I could do here is just, I could say, and probably what I would want, I'm guessing, is to specify sort of the X and Y axes where, um, like, let's see here where the height actually, yeah, like the optimal thing I think might be to just specify the X, Y axes as constant axes. So the X and Y axes would be unit length and we still specify the height. Uh, and then, you know, I would just grow the height to figure out how high I want it to be. Uh, and it would stay uniform. Um, and then if you wanted to, you could shrink the width by shrinking the X axis. So that way you're shrinking it proportionally. I don't know. It's really tough to say. It's real tough to say. Because the other thing we can do is just specify those two axes directly and just have them multiply by the scale and you never specify like that size um, and the width over height, that just never gets actually used. I guess I should think about what I actually want to have happen here, at least in this one specific case, so that I maybe can say that it'll at least work for one thing. So what I would want to do here, right, is we've got the, the hero and he's kind of a, you know, a trapezoidal looking thing and he's on top of another trapezoidal looking thing. Uh, and then he's got a point, which is the, where the head is. And so what I'm sort of saying is, well, okay, if the head shifts over to the side, um, what I've currently got going on is something that looks like this, right? And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to go ahead and correct this vector so that it points back towards the where the head is, right? Uh, now there's different ways that we can do that. Uh, we can leave this so that it, sh we could shear it. So we could make it so that it just goes like this right? Uh, which might make some sense. We could also rotate it this way and then scale it, right? And that would be a little bit different. That would look more, you know, like, like that. Uh, and I don't know which one of those is going to be uh, the right thing to do. But the reason that things are slightly complicated is because when we know, you know, if we have this thing, uh, or I should say, what we actually have is we just have a notion of uh, where the bitmap actually is. Uh, and it's, its width and height are determined by what the input art file is, right? And that makes things a little bit complicated because it means that we don't really have a stable sense uh, in the external code of what the width even is. So I guess we want to just keep doing it off of the height and we'll just specify some height stuff and say, hey, did we want, you know, uh, if we want to bend that height around, we'll just change what that Y axis is. Um, and that's it. I think that's probably what we're going to want to do. Now we're going to have a problem here. Uh, and that problem is going to be that like the pivot for the object is what we have to kind of work around. And I don't know to what extent we're already doing it. So here's our, our alignment. Uh, and the alignment gets baked into the offset. So I guess that will probably work correctly. But it's a little janky here because we've all, you know, we've kind of also got this concept that, you know, we're trying to talk about something that's based here and stretching to some point, but the actual bitmap is being rendered, you know, something more like this. Because remember, we haven't even gotten rid of the empty space there. So the actual bitmap is something that looks like that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so when we actually start here, and we want to displace to there, uh, then what we're essentially doing is we're having to sort of do the whole thing. This whole thing has to kind of happen like that, right? Uh, but it has to counter move. 
If it just did that, then this point would slide as well, which we didn't actually want. We wanted this point to remain rooted. So we have to counter slide this point by however much is necessary to keep this point in the, in a, the same place, right? Uh, essentially the pivot has to be respected. Uh, so we've got some work ahead of us to make this happen. The way that that's working now is inside get bitmap dim, you can see that we're using this align thing and that align point, that C align times Hadamard uh, nonsense, right? That code is actually aligning us to a bogus alignment point. It's the alignment point that we set um, uh, in when we packed the assets. And those alignment points are, I think, based on the ground, like where the ground is. And that's not something we actually want. Because now we're animating these three pieces separately, what we actually want is that point to be specific to, uh, like, basically the, the, uh, the sort of, the part around which we're rotating, the, part, the imaginary part that it connects to um, the, the legs. Uh, well, they're not really legs, because there's no legs. It's a legless child. Uh, the stump. So wherever it connects to the stump is what we actually would want that point to be, and that's not what that point is at the moment. Uh, now we can always override it, so that's not that big a deal. Uh, but it is worth noting that, like, that's probably something when we bake the art assets. Uh, you know, I'm gonna have to make sure when I produce some of the final art packs for this, we want to get those things right. Yeah. So this is kind of complicated. Uh, we're going to have to do a lot of work to sort of get this into the right, uh, to get this into to shape. Uh, but what I do think is true about this is I do think we want to just go ahead and say that you can pass X and Y ac uh, axes and we'll just scale those as necessary. So I think we probably keep roughly what we had. I think it'll probably work okay. Uh, and then we just say like, okay, yeah, when you pass one of these down, uh, we'll just go ahead and say it's size X. Uh, times the x-axis and size y times the y-axis and uh, I don't know so where is get bitmap dim used is it only used in this function so where else is it used get bitmap dim uh, is in text op. So get bitmap dim is used for uh, text rendering. And block work. Uh, so that's basically all that's used for. So I'm relatively free, it's only even used in the debug system, I'm relatively free to make changes to that and it's not a big deal. So if we take a look at what happens here where we've got the dim.size uh, that, that computes this information and we've got the dimensions.align uh, and all that nonsense. So in here, what I can do is say, well, this offset needs to be computed now based on those axes, right? Uh, because the alignment is gonna be now, is not gonna be done in uh, flat, 2D rectilinear. It's actually going to be like in the near sheared ro rotated space. Uh, so maintaining that alignment point, which of course is wrong at the moment, but if it were right, maintaining that alignment point has to be done uh, in a different way with this the, with this p value. And what we have to do is take that alignment and multiply it by the x and the y axes uh, to get what we actually need. I'm gonna change the way that this function is working. Uh, I'm gonna say that it's since we don't touch the Z, I'm gonna say that the dim PZ equals the offset Z. Uh, and then I'm gonna say that the XY uh, equals uh, basically the equation on the XY itself. Uh, and then I probably gotta actually change my underscores back to non underscores. Okay. So that is uh, step one. And again, we're not actually asking it to do anything yet, so we'll see the same thing. Uh, so after I do that, after I get the entry x-axis uh, and y-axis stuff, 
uh, I need to then pass them down in here, and this needs to be something that looks like this. Right? So this function now has to take an x-axis, which again can still be a default, so anyone who was calling this thing can still call it the same way that they were calling it before, and that's totes fine. Um, but it needs to know. Now again, hopefully that will produce no change, uh, and it doesn't, so that's good. Uh, and so now what I want to do is just see whether we can get some kind of a stretch going on here, right? Something that sort of, uh, uh, you know, moves the, kind of moves the, um, stretches the body out in some way. And it's going to be a little bit wrong, I think, um, but we'll do what we can. Because, uh, like I said, those, those pivot points are in the wrong place, unfortunately. Uh, so now if I go down to handmade, uh, handmade world mode, and I come in here to the, the hero body, what I can do is take a look at the distance between the head and the body. That's this head distance here. Um, so I'm going to take a, a V2, uh, or I guess we'll do a V3, which is the head delta. And I'm just going to take a look at what the difference between the two of them is. So where is the head uh, versus, where, where is the head moved relative to where the body is? That's the displacement off of those. And then I'm just going to try driving uh, a little bit of change in that y-axis um, based on that. So, uh, you know, when we kind of uh, compute that, uh, we come down here, I think we have the render code uh, for the hero head. And then here's the code for the hero body. Uh, so in here, what I can do is say, well, um, the torso and the cape, let's use a different, uh, I gotta take a look at all my parameters here. Uh, let's use a, a different thing for them. Let's use a different um, X and Y axis for them. Uh, so at the moment, I don't have any needs for color, although I feel like eventually we'll probably want to change the color of, of things on the hero. Uh, that would not surprise me. Uh, but anyway, we've got the color that we're passing. Uh, the CT line is always going to be 1.0. That's not going to change. Uh, and then we've got our x-axis, y-axis. Uh, so x-axis can start out, I don't know why I said before there when I didn't have to. Uh, our x-axis and our y-axis can start out being what they were previously. And looks like I didn't quite get that right. No two other code types could be, while well, trying to match the argument, okay, so render group, object transform, Ah, right. I missed one of my functions. Since we can pass the bitmap ID to these guys, uh, this push bitmap call also needs them. Okay. And so this should do exactly the same thing it was doing before because we're passing it through and we're fine. Uh, and so now what I would need to do is inside the world mode code, I need to actually have, I, I guess I'd probably, because we're doing rendering and, uh, and updating separately, I would need to store this in the sim entity structure as well. Uh, so inside here, uh, in sim entity, I will need to, add, uh, you know, x-axis, y-axis. Uh, and the x-axis, y-axis at the moment, because I don't really have any particular uh, desire to fuss with it, uh, is just going to be set to the default. 
Might as well set it on everybody. Could probably set this at construction someday. All right, so what I want to do here is I want to actually compute different ones for this, uh, for the hero's body. Uh, here I will just use, I will now get it out of the entity so that it can be stored by the entity update routines uh, to be whatever they want based on how they were moving. And uh, yeah, pretty straightforward. So now we just have to actually compute something and that's the part that I think we're probably going to have to put off till next week because there's this is going to be fairly complicated and we have to figure out how we're going to deal with the fact that the hotspots are in the wrong place. But anyway, uh, when I have that head delta there, what I could do is say, well, okay, whatever the head delta is, um, after I figure out where my new location is, I can go ahead and take my entity x-axis and I can compute, uh, I suppose that in the y-axis. I can go ahead and compute that by displacing that axis uh, relative to where the head is, right? And so if I'm going to do this, I could uh, I could do this fairly straightforwardly by saying, hey, what the x-axis is just whatever it is, or we could even leave the x-axis the same. In fact, maybe let's do that first. Uh, and I could say that the y-axis is just going to be whatever the y-axis would have been, plus some coefficient uh, times the displacement. Now this is going to be grotesquely wrong, but like I said, for the time being, I think that we're going to have to live with that. Um, do not know why I'm not seeing any results there. doing anything. Well, I guess we can start by saying, hey, this should make the guy be twice as big, right? Twice as tall. And it sure doesn't. Uh, so something's not happening. So here's Hero Body. It's getting those things out. It's passing them down. Uh, oh! <laughs> Right. Got to actually pass them. So that's getting passed there. This is getting passed there. Things fine and dandy. There we go. That's what I was expecting. Okay, good. Um, all right. So let's actually go and, and try that one more time. Uh, so here we are in world mode. I'm going to go up to our Y axis. Uh, and I'm going to say, I don't know why I made that an x-axis. There we go. So that now does exactly what I think it should do. So now we're operating at least properly. Uh, so now I'll put this back in here. Here we go. Uh, and so now, well, that's, that's great. I did it again. Uh, so now you can see I'm already starting to do that stretching, which is all fine and dandy. Um, it doesn't look particularly great though, right? You can, it, it's, it's not, it's, it's better than it was to a certain degree, um, but it's not fabulous, right? Like you probably don't want the game to look like that. Like that's not going to be, that's not going to be great. Um, so we'll have to start dealing with this next week because like I said, we're out of time at this point. Uh, but at least we now sort of have the renderer supporting us, if not our art assets, since our art assets are not really aligned in the way that they probably would need to be uh, in order for this to work properly.
So I saw the kid. Zircon and Crusted Tweezers, are you moving to Montana soon? Yeah, just me and the pygmy pony, man. Over by the dental floss bush. Frosty Ninja, why does our limbless hero need to suffer in such gruesome ways? Well, you know, it's tough being a video game character. You get squashed, you get stretched, you, you die repeatedly in a lot of games. Um... Twitch makes Twitch. Do I need the pay version of Mischief to change the background color? Uh, yes, I think so. But I would hold off on that because somebody on the handmade who w was a handmade hero uh, friend, uh, they made a replacement for Mischief, and it's supposedly almost ready. So we're probably going to switch to that uh, pretty soon now. So there's that. Will you try rotation to visually compare against shearing before deciding? Uh, probably what we'll do actually is a combination. So in order to get it as minimally messed up as possible, we'll probably do some rotation and some shearing. Uh, and that's, you know, I think probably the best that we're going to be able to do. Um, we might also try having one more frame of animation in each direction, or, or rather frame of imagery, so that when you're really far over, it like splays out, it like changes to another image. Um, uh, let's see. Steve Voucher, you wrote the scale shader this way because it's already done in the software renderer, but these transformations would usually be done in a vertex shader, right? Uh, no. These, these transformations have nothing to do with the vertex shader. Um, if you were trying to do these sorts of transformations, you would do them in a geometry shader, uh, is the way they would actually be done. So uh, this piece of information here here. So what you would do is this concept right here, this render entry bitmap, uh, this would actually be what you would send to the card. And then uh, the geometry shader would output, uh, it, well, the geometry shader would literally do exactly what you saw me do here. So this code would be in the geometry shader, like literally all of it. Like, right here and down, all of that would all be uh, in the geometry shader. Um, if you wanted to pass this width and height somehow, otherwise you'd do just this one part and you would, the thing that would be, in, but you'd pass the min, uh, min UV max UV to the geometry shader. Uh, some other games have similar move styles, but they use a floating indicator instead of separating the head from the body. Your thoughts? Uh, yes, this game's design very specifically requires you to not do that. Uh, you have to move the actual head. So I saw the kid. For collision detection, will there be skewed boxes as well, or will it just be A, A, B, B? Um, so I don't think we will probably have any actual collision detection on the hero anyway. It will probably be mostly semantic, um, if that makes sense. So uh, the body, sheared body, will not really be go undergoing collision detection, probably. Garlando Bloom. So we moved tile to tile. Haven't seen the new movement. Yes. We moved tile to tile. Erdomina. Are we eventually going to move these over to shaders? Um, if we had to for some kind of performance reason, we would. Uh, if we never do have to do that though, then no. Because uh, basically OpenGL programming is, is kind of useless programming, right? It's programming that won't be relevant in five years. Um, it's oftentimes not even relevant in two years because it's, you know, 
completely different. Uh, it all gets changed around repeatedly. So, you know, my preference would be to teach as little graphics API specific stuff as possible. Uh, I would rather show how to code it in software so that you know how it works. And then, you know, if for some reason you can't, if, if you actually go follow Handmade Hero to the point where you've written the software rasterizer, it should be trivial for you to go like learn how to drive a graphics API to it. Cause that's just like looking up the API's stuff and going, how do I call it to do this, right? Uh, Cause you already know exactly what has to happen. So it's just a question of like, okay, how do I call these things? Um, and those things change frequently. And so teaching them on the stream is like literally a complete waste of time. So I try to keep it just to the parts we actually need to do to make sure that the game runs okay uh, on GPUs. Any word on the new debugger? Uh, new debugger, I am not working on a debugger. If, if anyone thought that that was happening. Gary Johansson, you had a stream about someone contacting you about making a debugger. Uh, no, not contacting me. Uh, it was contacting... Oh, I know what you're talking about now. Uh, you're talking about the uh, the folks who were looking to put the debugger into 4Coder. I, now I know what you're talking about. Uh, I have no idea. I just did the stream because I was like, if people are trying to work on it, then I'm going to give them as much information about it as I can because I would love to have a debugger um, but unfortunately, uh, you know, I don't have much time to look into stuff like that. So I, I have no idea what they're doing with that. Um, I know that, uh, that Alan Webster has to finish up the UI, uh, upgrades in four coder before you could have like debugger looking things in it. And I would assume since I haven't seen any four coder updates in a while, that he is in the middle of finals and stuff since he's in school. So I'm guessing that, that probably until there is some free time um, for Alan, I'm guessing that we won't see anything. Uh, but, you know, maybe once school is out, uh, that, that will happen. Um, if that makes sense. And insofar as you say, I doubt the concept of shaders is going anywhere soon. Um, I, I disagree, right? Like, and this is, you know, this is, I guess, a, a point where I sort of um, uh, separate, I guess, from the conventional wisdom. Maybe it's just my wishful thinking. Um, but I don't really think, like, shaders are obviously stupid, right? They don't make any sense. Because essentially what they are is a way of having sort of like a way of pigeonholing a particular type of stuff that you might do in code who has a very irregular boundary that's based on a strange overlapping set of things that you that different hardware did or did not do at, at, at certain times or whatever um, and because of that rather disgusting architectural uh, artificial architectural creation, it means that it's constantly undergoing drastic revisions. Like, it first started out, it was um, 
a bunch of API calls that you used to set up like some blending things you could do. Then it moved to an assembly language thing that you programmed that was like DirectX, like certain, you could do a certain number of ops and those would be baked down, right, or whatever. Then it became like a sort of C-like thing that got compiled into these things. Now it's bifurcated, so there's like many C-like things, each of which can do certain select operations or one general purpose C thing that isn't really meant for rendering and you can sort of call that separately, but we don't even know where it goes in the pipeline. It's a non-sustainable system. And you know it's non-sustainable because it hasn't ever remained the same for more than like a year or two in a row, right? And they're constantly having to add all this nonsense about like, oh, we added this new way of accessing textures, so we added all these APIs for it, and then those get routed in through the shit and the blah, blah, blah. It's like, it, it's stupid. It's just, it's a dumb, dumb way to do things. The correct way to do things is to like create an actual programming model just like a CPU, export what that is as an ISA, and then we code to it. Like, just get there, right? Uh, and so I kind of feel like it's inevitable that we will get there because if shaders were the right model, then that's how we'd be programming actual code. Like, that's how we would actually be programming computers is all shaders. You wouldn't have, like, the ability to write a program you would write a collection of things. This is a, a piece of string code and it would be in string lang, right? And like this thing over here, oh, well, this is written in blah, right? Uh, and so I think it's gotta get there eventually because it's the only actual sustainable model that I know about. Um, so, and the fact that shaders have changed so radically like every two, three years uh, since their inception, I feel like it's gotta go there eventually now, unfortunately, it'll probably still be super janky, but I just don't think the current way that shaders work is gonna be relevant to anybody in like five years, let's say. I just, I just don't think so. I think at the very least in five years, we'll be on some different conceptualization of shaders that's not like the one that's, that's now, right? Like they're not separated into five stages anymore. There's like, a, they've been reorganized or something like this, right? Um, and so I kind of think that's got to happen. And I hope it happens sooner rather than later, but of course it probably won't. And we'll probably have another 10 years of every two years you have to relearn how shaders work because they've been completely modified, you know. Miblo, do you think you'll use the spring code from the other day on the camera movement? I'm imagining a critically damp spring would be the thing to use for that. Um, Peppeeve is non-critically damp springs on camera code. So we would definitely not use a non-critically damp spring. I don't know that we would ever use a spring. We would probably use a B-spline. Um, maybe, I don't really, well, you know what, I don't know. You might be right. Critically damp spring could be good. Just never use an under damp spring for camera. There are so many games that use an under damp spring for camera. It makes people nauseous. I oftentimes get sick trying to play Steven's Sausage Roll because the, um, the camera is an under damp spring. So it shoots past the guy and then goes back and you feel like you're getting like, you know, like your, your head's going crazy. I see tons of games that do that. It's awful. Super nauseating.
so it looks like we got really no more cues about what we were doing. For land of loom, for camera stuff, I just do x plus equals x minus desk divided by 10. Uh, well, where's the time? Where's t in there? Matt, where is, where is t in that equation? There is no t. Where is the t? Orlando Bloom, that's not accounting for T, that's if it was instantaneous. Ooh. So you, you just apply that no matter what the time step was. So it takes, you know, um, in one frame, you are going to move one tenth of the way to the destination, no matter what. Is that the idea? Or it's like I move a tenth of the way to the destination every time, which also means you'll never actually get there. I mean, you will because of floating point, but that's a Zeno's paradox kind of thing, right? It's like I'll never actually reach the, um, the destination point. And, and yes, Alan, I think you're correct. Like, if it's actually x minus dest, then it would be moving a tenth of the way away from the destination. Um, this is like fixed FPS, so it was fine, but I've changed. Hold on, look it up. Uh, well, so yeah, if you're if you're wondering what that would be, that's that's basically a like a, a logarithmic or exponential, however you want to look at it. Um, Uh, so if what you're doing there is <clears throat> this is distance and this is time uh, I'll say this is distance from target uh, then what you're effectively doing is saying well I'm always going to start off by moving the most right off the bat, right? Because you've eff effectively got distance over 10, right? Or stated alternately, distance divided by something, right? Is your amount. And so the higher the distance, the more you will move. And so the very first move is the most, is most of the move, right? Is the, is the most you will ever do. Everything after that move will be less, right? Uh, and so what you're gonna do is you're gonna look like this. Right, so this is what your approach curve looks like. It's like an asymptotic, you know, kind of thing that that looks like that. Um, so you know, like a hyperbola or something like this is what you would think of for that kind of a curve. Uh, and it'll never get there, right? It'll never actually get to zero distance, other than the fact that floating point will eventually round it. Um, but that's what would actually happen. And uh, the reason that I wouldn't do something like that, like I wouldn't really recommend that, is there's no acceleration, right? It's instantaneous. So it immediately jerks the camera as hard as possible towards the target, if the target's somewhere else. Uh, and you know, you probably want a little bit of acceleration there, right? Like I would argue the correct curve probably looks something like this, you know? Um, because you want that camera to like start moving a little bit, just just even a little bit. It doesn't have to be huge, you know. You don't want it to feel sluggish necessarily, but 
feel like you want a little bit there. You don't want to just have a massive instantaneous acceleration and then everything else is deceleration, um, right? Because this is basically like instantaneous, uh, huge acceleration, and then every other point is deceleration, right? Decelerates here, decelerates here, decelerates here, decelerates here, right? Um, so I, I wouldn't, you know, I mean, there might be a reason why you would want to do that, but I wouldn't recommend it because it, it really doesn't have a very flattering curve there, I think. And also, obviously, it's time step dependent. But you could make you could make a time step independent one of these. So I still just wouldn't recommend necessarily shaping the curve like that, necessarily. Uh, plans on adding camera shake or blur are similar if the hero gets hit or a boulder hits the ground near the hero. Uh, yeah, I mean, probably. I don't know. Those are kind of polished sorts of stuff that I'm not sure how important it is um, to to think about like now. Um, but but they're definitely things that we might want. And they're pretty trivial for us to implement, right? Because we can shake the camera without having really to do much. All right, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. So silly looking now. That's just really silly. All right, let's go ahead and close that down. Thank you everyone for joining me for another episode of Handmade Heroes. It's been a pleasure coding with you as always. If you would like to follow along at home, you can pre-order the game on handmadehero.org and it comes with a source code so you can follow along with the daily programming. We also have a forum site uh, that is hosted at Handmade Network now, uh, which is pretty cool. You can check it out if you wanna ask questions uh, or hang out with other people who watch the series. You can also go to our Patreon page if you want to support the videos. Uh, you can also check out our schedule bot if you're trying to catch us live, which uh, we'll post this weekend, the schedule for next week, as we often do. And we also have our wonderful episode guide maintained by the fabulous Miblo uh, that allows you to catch up with past episodes with ease, with ease, unprecedented ease, I might, I might say. So check all that out. Um, we'll be back here probably Monday. Again, check the schedule box for the schedule if you want to catch us next week. Until then, have a good weekend of programming, and I will catch you guys on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.